you, Julien. Merci, gracias. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it uh, because uh, since we have all this time in the discussion time, uh, discussion slot, I'm not going to go over a lot of the sort of uh, comparisons and debates uh, about uh, the different approaches. There are uh, some excellent articles, especially issues of paleoanthropology, and among others, uh, that have gone over some of the differences. I thought today the point was really to compare, contrast, combine, ideally, these approaches and ideally separate. The, these differences and put them together, so reconcile them if you want. Um, reconciling sounds like maybe we had a divorce, but I don't think we ever had a divorce. It was probably a amicable separation. Um, but anyways, we can we can come back to this. I just took a lot of this from Odu's and also from Tostevan's uh, article in 2011, and we can come back to it. And these are just maybe some more talking points. Uh, but what I want to do today is give you three examples of work that I've done in Eastern North America, Eastern Canada, Quebec, um, from three different periods uh, that I hope will show you that uh, we are able to combine these two approaches. Uh, we're very fortunate in Quebec that we, of course, speak French, so we can read a lot of the French work uh, as well in French that may not be translated. Uh, and I'll give you three examples, one from the Paleo-Union period, so the oldest period, where it's really dominated by bifacial technologies, one from the archaic period where it's a radical change to unifacial bipolar technologies, and then one from the later woodland period, which is, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but there's ground stone and some stuff that's chipstone tools that sometimes I really wonder what the hell is trying to do. So uh, the Paleo-Union period, of course, uh, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's the first colonizers in North America. In Quebec, the late Paleo-Indian is, is a period when people are still hunting caribou in periglacial settings. Uh, Nine, ten thousand years ago, uh, this is what the environment looked like near the site that I'm going to present. Um, it is the kingdom, the empire of the biface. Uh, people say that in North America we're obsessed with bifaces. I think it's true. Uh, I think these people were obsessed with bifaces, and let me tell you, they were incredible. Uh, flint mappers. Uh, I worked for several years on a series of quarries and lithic workshops in Gatsby of these late Paleo Indian uh, people, and uh, essentially what they're producing 99.999% of the time is bifaces. And what's wonderful about these quarry workshops is that we have everything, the entire sequence of production from the extraction of the rock from the quarry face right to the production of finished bifaces and points, projectile points. Now, when I first looked at this, being trained in North America, I took our, one of our Bibles, which is Eric Callahan's work. Uh, Eric Callahan, if you don't know it, it's a fantastic piece of work. You can get it in PDF format. He's an experimental archaeologist, replicated a lot of this stuff himself. The drawings are fantastic. I think they're as good as the European drawings. Uh, and it's really an incredible piece of work for understanding bifacial technology, especially for Paleo-Indians. So I thought, this is fantastic. I have like my guidebook. I'm just going to apply this. So what I did is I applied it. I played his approach to relation stages uh, of the bifaces. I um, used, uh, it's primarily based on sort of ratios of, of width to thickness uh, of the lines and preforms and finished bifaces. And that was great because it kind of helped me to talk to other specialists in the Paleo-Indian and tell them what we were doing, what these people were doing up in Gas Bay 9,000, 10,000 years ago. Um, but of course, at a certain point, you, all you can really say is that, oh, okay, they produced a lot of preforms, uh, and sometimes they finished the bifaces, and sometimes they went down to the seaside and finished the bifaces down there. Um, but of course, at least it's, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, way of uh, studying these bifaces, and it's based on, like I said, replication, a lot of replication. Now, I wasn't really totally satisfied with that, so I went to another excellent uh, source, D.C. Waldorf, another plant mapper. Uh, another guidebook for North American analysts. And, and D.C. Waldorf had actually looked at this same similar kind of uh, um, bifacial production where you're starting out with a tabular piece, and I thought, okay, maybe I can get a better understanding of what they're doing here. Uh, I'll use D.C. Waldorf, and I'll sort of understand how they're going through the sequence of, from the tabular pieces down. And, and that helped quite a bit. We were able to even see how some of the bifaces kind of rotate uh, the, the, the cross sections rotate on these uh, preforms, and uh, it really, really uh, was very similar to what Waldorf had described. 
And so that took us one step further. Um, but I still felt like I hadn't really gotten to the end of the story. So more recently, uh, one of my graduate students, by Nicolas Carr, uh, he was trained by Nicole Pigeot, but he's in Montreal. So I said, my Nick, you know, if I think I've only I've gotten to the end of the story of what I can do with my training. I'm, I want you to take a schéma pédagogique approach. So he has done a schéma diacritique of hundreds of these five faces. This is his drawings. He has grouped them into technological groups, and his PhD is almost done. And so what he's done is he's essentially shown us that there is, of course, much more variability in the production at these quarry workshops that we probably didn't see. He's got he's given us a much better insight into skill and the learning that's happening at these quarry workshops, and he's even able to group these into techni technical, what they call group technique, uh, which I think are, are going to give us a much um, sort of better insight or finer uh, insight into what these people were doing. So I think it's that's sort of a success story. Of course, I can't take credit. Manek is really the guy who can take credit for that. Um, now, we jump forward into the Archaic period, a very long period. This is, a, there's a big change in lifestyle here. Uh, forest covers coming in, people are becoming more sedentary, they're starting to fish, they're starting to trap a lot of smaller uh, mammals, for example. It's a really uh, big change in lifestyle. And I looked at a collection from a, a site near Quebec City. This is a crazy collection. I mean, I, I, I'm... I'm at ease with my faces. Uh, every, anybody who analyzes quartz knows that quartz is hard. Um, every tool in this assemblage is about this big. There's no bifaces on this assemblage. None. Zero. And it's all made out of quartz, both vein quartz and crystal quartz. And so I said, I don't really know what to do with this. And archaeologists in, in the eastern North America were kind of, uh, I don't know, they were kind of stumped. Uh, they were at an impasse, I think. I was too. We didn't know how to explain this. Obviously, it was a big technological change, but we didn't know how to deal with it. And I think that we were kind of falling back always on our typologies. And because the typologies had no place for this technology, we didn't know what to do with it. So I was very lucky because Killian Driscoll came to spend a year with me. Now, Killian, those of you who know, is a court specialist from Ireland, worked primarily in the Neolithic and Mesolithic, has published a lot, has done replications, trampling, even here in Barcelona. He was here in Barcelona. Um, and he, I said, Killian, I'm not going to tell you anything about the site. I just want you to look at it as a person coming from Europe and sort of do a more of a technological analysis, not necessarily the schéma diacritique, but, but maybe look at how you would classify it you know, from your perspective. And so he identified a lot of small bipolar cores, platform cores, uh, things that he uh, classified as scrapers, and retouch lights. And that, of course, was great because it kind of gave us, a, again, a different view of... of what these tools were, instead of just saying, oh, they're tiny, what, what could they possibly be doing with these things, and are they really tools? And, um, and I, I looked through these collections with him, and then after, after we did this, well, we, we said to ourselves, okay, well, obviously we were a bit uh, frustrated uh, because we still wanted to know really what they were used for. So uh, well, this is just the sort of the classification, just to show you that there's a lot of uh, flakes that are, a lot of sort of tools or retouch flakes and, and, and things made on flakes that are produced bipolarly, and then there's cores that are also used as tools, and, and I wouldn't call them recycled. I think the cores themselves are the blanks, and then they're flakes that are also blank. So uh, there is an intentionality in this production, um, but I don't have time to get into that. But really what we wanted to do was then maybe do U-Swear. Now, U-Swear on quartz is really hard, <laughs> but Marie-Michel Zion was trained in Denmark, and analyze quartz uh, in assemblages from the Arctic, and I asked her if she could look at this for us. And we weren't sure if we would find stuff because this has been 9,000, 10,000 years in the ground, no, 8,000 years in the ground, and uh, you know a lot of freeze thaw. But she had a pretty good success rate in finding uh, use wear. And I guess what was amazing was that um, we were able to find a really very wide variety of uses of these tiny tools, whether they were used flakes, retouched tools, scrapers, or things that. Killian had called, uh, classified as an end scraper, a side scraper. In some cases, they were just flakes that we randomly chose to make sure that we weren't missing something. So, I mean, again, that, I think this was a great combination of sort of different perspectives, uh, especially the high-powered use-wear approaches that are more typical of Europe than North America uh, right now. Now, uh, a third uh, example is, is, again, a very, very different uh, uh, technology. Now we're talking about people who are 
living in large villages, they are horticulturalists, they grow squash and corn and beans, they live in these big longhouses, they make beautiful pottery. Um, and it seems as if they really didn't need stone tools anymore. Um, we have a great uh, assemblage of ground stone tools, which is great, and I'm, I, I admit that I've had to learn a lot about uh, analyzing ground stone tool, uh, tool forms, and, um, and so that's, that's one part of the assemblage, and certainly that's uh, relatively straightforward to deal with. Um, but uh, when it comes to the chipstone tool, again, it's, it's very, if you allow the word, expedient. Uh, it's made on different uh, local raw materials of very poor quality. Sometimes they're just things that we might call a retouched flake or, or a used flake because you might see a bit of uh, use wear on it. And so um, what I did is, in this case, I, I, I first started to see if I could do some kind of a technological analysis, a very sort of careful technological analysis of these pieces. Um, but what I found was that, uh, a bit like I had mentioned in the abstract, there's we, we don't really have a lot of core technologies in North America and uh, with what they, the French would call pré-determination. So uh, there's no, it's hard to see a logic in a lot of this uh, technology. I was nonetheless able to you know, reconstruct how they use the local church cobbles. A lot of it was bipolarly uh, reduced or, or, or worked and then to produce maybe a flake or two. Uh, there was a regional material, again, a Hornfels terrible material. If it were cornfells, that they were in some cases flaking. In this case, they were managing to rough out uh, forms that I think they were actually then grinding down into axes. So that's interesting because that's a completely different position of Adwa. And then the only real formal tools we ever found were with maybe one or two projectile points, and those, those always showed up on the site in finished form. And they come from often quite long distances. So in this case, I wasn't really able to apply the traditional. Um, uh, as you would say, the lecture technologique, as they would say in French, of these materials, but I was able to apply it more in terms of what I would call the, the uh, organization of the raw material economy. In other words, how, it, when you analyze each raw material, how each one is going through a different chenoparatois, and how some of these are segmented. In other words, obviously, the, the tools are coming in, in finished form while well, you're only having the, the end of the chenoparatois. In fact, they're rarely even reworked. And then in some cases, we have local materials that are uh, completely worked uh, and then turned into tools, but generally very expedient tools. So um, that was very fast, uh, whirlwind tool tour of 12,000 years of human history and half a continent. But um, I guess my, my conclusions or just more, more just like things that we could maybe talk about is, uh, you know, my question was, can these two approaches be combined? I think they can. Uh, but not uncritically. This is something that Constantin said uh, in 2011. Uh, are, they, are they two approaches of compatible? I think they are, but uh, again, uh, maybe not necessarily on a theoretical level, in the sense of theoretical, as uh, North Americans might refer to as sort of higher level theory or uh, social theory. Um, again, this is something that Constantin has mentioned, or Luz as well. Um, and are there challenges? Well, obviously there's challenges. There's always challenges. Um, uh, I think primarily it's at the training level. Uh, I've noticed that, for example, in, in my university, even though we can read French and it's great to be able to read all these French uh, authors, um, for example, we don't have a course where we teach people how to draw the schéma diacritique to actually do a proper analysis and draw the techni tec technical drawings. Um, and so that might be a thing that we could talk about. And then in the future, uh, well, you know, can, what is the future for this? I think obviously the future is really uh, doing maybe what we're doing here, especially with the younger scholars, the scholars that can uh, hopefully move across the Atlantic or can be trained in different places and have the ability to have this mobility either through Erasmus or other uh, ways of, of being exposed to different uh, approaches. So I'm done.